you're not saying, no, no, don't feel like that. You know, you're not a burden. We will look after you, whatever it takes. Suddenly you change it. You say, maybe you're right. Maybe you are a burden. What does it do for suicide prevention in mentally ill people to, to change from saying, whatever happens, we will always support you to, in certain circumstances, we will actually help to kill you. That's crazy. This, that must be a hard practice to be in, no? This is the best work I've ever done. It is such an honor to be part of somebody's uh, death. Really? Really. Dr. Alan Weeb, welcome to my podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, be before we get started, can you give me a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Um, I have been a family doctor for many, many, many years, and uh, I had a full service family practice doing everything from cradle to grave and uh, for a, a long time. And then uh, I concentrated on women's health, uh, which um, uh, primarily was uh, abortion and contraception. And uh, since our law changed in uh, 2016, I have been providing medically assisted deaths. So now I don't do any family practice anymore, and I um, just do um, the women's health and uh, assisted dying. Okay, and, sorry, and, and you said, and I'm a professor at the university, and I uh, uh -huh. do lots of research, um, have publications, and teaching, and and that sort of thing. Okay, great. Um, you said when the law changed in, in 2016. So what was that law? So this is the medical assistance and dying law in Canada. And that um, uh, came about because of a constitutional court case. Uh, the court decided that Canadians had the constitutional right to uh, have an assistive death. And in the particular situation of having uh, a, um, a grievous and irremediable condition that caused unbearable suffering, and they had to be voluntary. Uh, then uh, that was the court decision, and then the law came in, which added some safeguards that there had to be two clinicians uh, that uh, agreed that, that somebody uh, was eligible under the law, uh, that there had to be, um, you know, a waiting period and and um, a uh, witness for the consent, etc. Uh, then that law was amended uh, in 2021 from another court case, which said that uh, some of the safeguards did not follow the constitution and were um, therefore struck down. And the main one was that the uh, natural death be reasonably foreseeable. Now, I know that mm. your uh, audience are in different countries, so I just want to compare a little bit. In um, the US, 20% of Americans are live in states where they do have assisted dying as well. Uh, all of those states, except Montana, mm. have the rule that your natural, that, that your expected death be within six months. And ours was that their natural death must be reasonably foreseeable. Uh, and then that was struck down uh, so that the idea that, um, uh, you know, somebody who, who could expect to suffer unbearably for the next 30 years um, also had the right to an assisted death. Uh, in Australia, most of the states have assisted dying and they their laws uh, are um, either a six months or 12 months, uh, so that the expected death must be within six to 12 months. Uh, and in all cases, uh, the issue of an assisted death means that a clinician, a doctor, or an, uh, a nurse practitioner can um, prescribe a medication that would end the death or um, uh, actually uh, give the medication. Uh, we have in addition to our laws, we have a number of regulations and standards and guidelines that we have to follow. Uh, these are through our province, through our um, uh, professional organizations, uh, by the people who uh, license us. So we have coming from every direction. 
And uh, mm-hmm. so in Canada, it's rare that anybody gets the medication uh, to drink and uh, do it themselves uh, because our regulations are that we must be there. All right. And that, um, yeah. as, uh, so, and that, um, I have to have the, um, uh, intravenous medication ready in case there uh, something goes wrong. So in Europe, this is called euthanasia when a doctor actually, um, injects the medication, uh, actually gives the medication to a patient. But in Canada, we don't use the word euthanasia except for involuntary. Like the, that's what we use for our pets um, when nice them. Uh, here we call it assisted yeah. dying, and uh, in some places it's called assisted suicide. And especially in a place like Switzerland or uh, the U.S., where uh, they are required to ingest and. Uh, or to do it themselves, and uh, so that's that's sort of how the terminology goes. Okay, so in Switzerland, so you just said they're required to do it themselves. So you don't have a doctor administering it; they have to administer it. Uh, yes, and so um, hmm. our one clinic uses IVs, but the but the person must actually push the button. Wow. That, okay allows the ID fluid to come through. Um, and another clinic uh, generally gives people something to drink. Hmm. Hey guys, if you enjoy a few glasses of wine once a week or a drink at any point in your life in any amount, you need to try the supplement I launched, After Party. It helps you break down acetaldehyde, which is the toxin that alcohol, ethanol, converts into in your body when you drink that poisons you and leads to alcohol damage. The supplement is made of dihydromyrositin, which is a terrible name for a supplement, which is why we called it After Party, which also works weekly on GABA, so it can help with anxiety following drinking as well if that's something that bugs you. Obviously, don't abuse alcohol, but if you're into biohacking and you don't have a hangover pill, you're doing it wrong. You could say you're doing biohacking wrong if you drink anything, but hey, life is life. Sometimes people want to have a few drinks. Smartdrugs.life. Code MP for 15% off, and you can try it for 30 days completely risk-free because we'll give you your money back if you don't want it. Obviously, there's no point in getting wasted, so don't do that. But there's also no point in drinking any amount without helping your body break down acetaldehyde. So try it out, smartdrugs.life, code MP for 15% off. I hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. How does that work for people who have, you know, end of life diseases that stop them from moving exactly just, exactly yeah. and that's um uh, and that's why um most of uh, um canada and and most of the australian states allow for intravenous if if somebody has trouble in um the benelux countries that's netherlands uh, belgium and luxembourg almost everybody uses IV for the same reason they the canadians do it's that it's faster, it works quickly, it doesn't taste bad, it, uh, and the doctors uh, are, are expected to be there. Yeah. This, that must be a hard uh, practice to be in, no? Well, you know, I've been a doctor for 47 years now, and I've loved my career. Um, I delivered over a thousand babies, and uh, I took care of families, as I said, from cradle to grave, and that's I love. But I can tell you that this is the best work I've ever done. Really? It's not strict. Really? And why Why is that? Why is that? It is such an honor to be part of somebody's uh, death, to um, have, to be able to offer them this, this control over the end of their lives. Uh, it's such a... Um, it's a, such an honor to to have these conversations with people. Um, what I don't know. Why have you decided to die now? What makes your life worth living? What um, do you want to get done before you die? How would you like your death to look? And uh, I'm you know I'm privileged to be there for the last goodbyes between 
spouses, you know, I've been together for 15 years. I'm, um, I, as a, as a doctor, there were, um, times when I couldn't, couldn't end somebody's suffering, um, whether I had to helplessly watch somebody suffer, uh, at the end of life. You know, I studied palliative care and I did my best. Uh, I got the, um, people who knew more than I did to help me, uh, but there was still so much suffering at the end of life. And, mm -hmm. um, now I can actually end the suffering and it's, um, just for people who want it. I mean, I, um, it's, we, we only work with people who, uh, are asking for it. And I ask at the very last minute, are you sure this is what you want to do today now? And, uh, so yeah. Yeah. Um, I can, like, I can see, I didn't realize, so did Canada not have this option prior to 2016? Correct. Okay. Okay. I, I had a grandmother uh, who passed away from Alzheimer's and it was just brutal. It was just brutal. And I had a great, uh, great uncle who had a uh, ALS and again, brutal, super traumatizing for everybody around them. And so I can definitely see where this can stop a lot of suffering that nobody wants to go through or bring on their family. Um, what, what's the, who's the average person you, you think you see who asks for this? We know, but we've got statistics, you know, we've got okay. national statistics and I keep my own as well. Um, so we know that, um, the vast majority have cancer and, uh, they're, uh, the average age is 70. Hmm. Uh, so it's, uh, it's typically people who are white, rich, well-educated, used to being in charge of their lives. You know, we get, uh, uh, so many, you know, retired doctors and lawyers and <laughs> business people, uh, the kind yeah. of people who are used to, yeah, um, being in control. And when they find out that they've got their stage four cancer or their ALS, uh, in some countries it's called what motor neuron disease instead of ALS. Uh, when they find out that they've got that diagnosis and and they are see what's coming up, uh, you know they they call them and uh, and, and you know that's been the most important change I think for our country is um, that now when you get that, I mean, we're all dying, right? I mean, 100% of us. And when you get that awful diagnosis, uh, and it's happened since 2016 to three of my close friends, where they got the diagnosis, stage four cancer, it's, there's no more treatment available, nothing can do. Um, they know, right, made before they do anything else, they know that they have made available. And so um, they called me up and asked about it because I know that that's how when I do. And it just gives them more peace going forward. I mean, each of my friends went ahead and, and took treatments and and took whatever um, is, was offered. One is has had her made and the other two are still uh, doing cancer treatments. Um, but uh, they know that they're going to die of their cancer soon and they know that they've got control like um something not a lot but some control uh, and that's just made such a difference you know now before you face this you know you're going to have some control over the end of your life if you want it yeah yeah interesting okay um what about the scenario when people are having mental illness and the mental illness is painful enough? Yes. What happens to those people? Exactly. So uh, our law currently um, um, excludes anybody for whom the sole underlying medical condition is mental illness. Okay. Ah, okay. Uh, this happened with the um, uh, with the uh, uh, amendment in 2021. They put in the restriction. They gave, they gave it a sunset clause, which meant that it expired in two years, which was next month, but then uh, just gave an extension for, for a year. Ah, okay. So in 2024, March 17, uh, uh, people will be eligible for um, uh, psychiatric suffering when that is their sole underlying medical condition is the psychiatric uh, condition. 
But we have lots of experience now with uh, concurrent disorders. I mean, lots of people who have both physical and mental illness. And when I uh, first was dealing with this, um, you know, I was a bit of a struggle because in all my yeah. year practice, if somebody said they wanted to die, I would think, oh, they were depressed. <laughs> and, yeah. And uh, now I was I was listening to people who had perfectly logical reasons to say I want to die um, because they had ALS and they had a line in the sand. I'm not going past this line in, in how much I'm willing to degenerate and become dependent on others. And so I had to figure out, okay, 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 so what do we know about depression and how it can interfere with people's ability to think and and make decisions and and of course I wasn't alone. I had all my colleagues and and uh, psychiatrists had uh, to consult and and so on. So seven years later I have um and, and you know, you know forty seven years of being a doctor, uh, I have a lot of experience with people who have concurrent disorders, you know, serious mental illness plus a physical uh, condition that would make them eligible for an assisted death. And in my research, um, we are looking now at what's been happening since 2021 when we could help people with the chronic conditions, the ones where they still had a long life expectancy uh, and expectation of suffering for uh, maybe a decade mm -hmm. or more. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, we have discovered in our research that um, a majority of these people have serious mental illness. Now, as you can imagine, if you are suffering unbearably from some physical condition for decades, um, would that make you have mental distress? Yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. So a lot of it is just secondary. Um, but there also was um, a mental illness that's just concurrent uh, and the more serious ones, you know, schizoaffective and bipolar with psychosis and uh, and um, personality disorders, um, uh, the, the, the severe ones uh, and so on. So we have we have now had quite a bit of experience with concurrent mental disorders where people are suffering terribly from a mental condition um, in addition to physical conditions. And so I, I am facing 2024 um, with the uh, confidence that, uh, that we can do our assessments well and um, help people after that time. It's um, uh, the assessments that we need to do are, first of all, for capacity. Can this person make this decision reasonably. If you're actively psychotic, you can't. I mean, um, mm. uh, but if you're delusional about certain things, you can. Like, for example, I had a patient who was um, dying of, of a really nasty bone cancer or in awful pain. Now, she was delusional. She was totally convinced the FBI were watching her in that nursing home, <laughs> which seemed a little odd. Um, but she was not delusional about the fact that she had pain caused by bone cancer. Uh, she knew precisely. Mm. So she did have capacity to make the decision that she um, didn't want to suffer that pain anymore. And and the fact that um, she still believed that the FBI were after her um, was, wasn't was um, interfering with her ability to make that decision. So even somebody who has some delusions can make um, medical decisions. It's more complicated to figure it all out, right? But uh, it's possible. And, you know, I mean, uh, I have a family member with schizophrenia, and there are, in the last 17 years since he was diagnosed, um, there were four occasions on which his rights were taken away. He was hospitalized against his will and treated against his will. But all of the rest of the time, he has the same rights as any other citizen. He has he can direct his own care. He can do everything, and he doesn't always, you know, make wise decisions that 
his parents agree with, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but um, he has true rights, and that's uh, also what what um, I um, realize when I'm talking to my patients who have the conquer disorders. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, let me see. I've got a list of questions that I try to stick to. Um, okay, yeah. What are the steps patients need to go through with a physician to be allowed to get medically assisted? What, what is it called in Canada? Medically assisted death? Um, medical assistance in dying. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, okay. Uh, it's, um, um, and in the U.S., medical aid in dying, which hmm. is both, uh, um, the acronym is made for both countries. <laughs> uh, so uh, the uh, first thing is a request and uh, the we have in Canada, we've got um, the coordinating centers in every province. Uh, and so you can go through your May coordinating center. Uh, you look it up on the internet and find it. Or, you know, through your doctor or through somebody you know. And uh, the May coordinating office will then uh, find you a, a doctor or uh, a nurse practitioner to do the assessment. Um, some of them come uh, referred from other doctors, just the way doctors refer to each other. Yeah, you know, yeah. family knows who I am and uh, refers their patient to me. Um, and some just find me because I have a website and, um, you know, want people to be able to access this. It's they don't know how other, uh, other, uh, other ways of doing it. And so uh, each province has uh, uh, request forms that people fill in, and these, uh, by law, must be witnessed by an independent person. An independent person means somebody who is not um, providing the maid, like I can't do it, uh, yeah. and who is not in your will. So, ah, um, okay. Example: my staff can do it because uh, they're not directly providing anything uh, for these patients, and they aren't in the patient's will. So uh, there's sort of the request and then um, two clinician assessments. And these assessments are, they can be done by video, like I do lots by Zoom uh, or in person. And, um, you know, we have to make sure that um, they uh, fit all the criteria. So they have to be able to make a voluntary request, be capable of making such a request. They have mm. to have grievous and irremediable condition. Uh, that's causing unbearable suffering, and and uh, we have to decide whether their natural death is reasonably foreseeable in Canada because we have to um, separate them into track one or track two. Track one has no wait list, so these are our cancer patients and and, and uh, heart failure patients who uh, have a natural death that's reasonably foreseeable. Uh, they can choose, you know, well, their date whenever they want. Uh, anybody whose uh, natural death is not reasonably foreseeable has a three-month uh, waiting period. And during that time, when we must um, make sure that they have explored everything that, that uh, is available in terms of dealing with symptoms um, generally, um, you know, they've had their their condition for, for a decade or more, and uh, they... Uh, have explored everything, but sometimes we can figure out, oh, well, uh, there is a new treatment. And, um, you know, the last time you saw a specialist in your area was four years ago and it yeah, it wasn't available then. So it's our job to figure that out uh, to see whether there is, is something that they've missed uh, um, during that during that three month period. Okay, that makes sense. And is that, do you know if that's similar in the U.S. and in Switzerland uh, and... Yeah, so uh, in the U.S., there's um, most, some of the states have waiting periods, but they're short, they're, they're like two weeks, um, and um, none of them have uh, formic illness uh, allowed. It's it's all um, mm. uh, natural, uh, their, their expected death is six months or 12 months. And how long... I mean, it's a, you probably know this, but how long has that... I didn't know that that was available because you said it wasn't available in Canada before 2016. So there have been states in America that have had medically assisted dying for illnesses oh. that were going to end lives for a while? Over 20 years. Oregon ah. got their law over 20 years ago. 
Um, Washington State was next. Uh, California was the same time as we were in 2016. Um, so yeah, so the uh, as I said, 20% of the population of the U.S. are in states where they uh, do have right uh, the right to an assisted death. Hmm. Okay. And was Switzerland one of the first places to have this? Because I'd, I'd heard of Switzerland yes. for a while. Switzerland, um, uh, what happened was all, all the countries, um, or most Western countries, had a law against suicide um, where people actually got put in jail if they'd failed a suicide attempt. Um, yeah. And that those laws were all rescinded, you know, a, a long time ago. And back in the 1940s, when Switzerland rescinded their suicide law, so they no longer put people in jail if they failed their suicide attempt, then they had um, in there, it said that um, uh, anybody who assisted a person to suicide for monetary gain um, was like, <sighs> but people who didn't, we were not. And so hmm. it meant that anybody, not that didn't have to be a doctor, um, could assist somebody to suicide as long as they weren't um, um, benefiting out of their will or, or something like that, right? And it took a while before there were actually clinicians who were um, providing this. They also ha do not um, have a residency requirement. Um, each of the American states and the Australian states and mm. in, um, Canada have residency requirements, so we can't take foreigners. But Switzerland doesn't, so they're the one place that people uh, can travel to to get an assisted death. Hmm. Okay, that must have been why I'd heard of that. Exactly. Because people could travel there. Interesting. Okay. Are, are doctors, uh, our medical associations, do they ever recommend assisted death? Or does this have to be brought up by the patient? Uh, that's not the same thing. Uh, so the important thing is um, what we call the serious illness conversation. So when somebody has developed a fatal illness and uh, a thinking doctor is, is having that conversation, uh, you know, this is what's happening this your heart failure has gotten to the point where um we can only just manage it and uh, your life expectancy is now short uh then the important thing is to make sure they know their options and that would be you know what kind of um palliative care how can we make you more comfortable um available in our area is there a hospice uh, residential hospice for example home care hospice where um, people will come into your home and help take care of you as you die um and it, you know what is available for you and at that point um uh, they should know that there is medically assisted death available because that's part of how you would choose you might say um, okay, well, I don't want to burden my family when I'm no longer strong enough to, you know, make it to the toilet and so on. So uh, I would go into a residential hospice at that point rather than expect my family to be taking care of me. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, um, you have to actually know that that one particular residential hospice won't allow me an assisted dying there, and mm. um, you need to choose one over the other. Uh, so you need to know these things. You need to know what's available and how best to plan the end of, of your life, of whether you want a natural death or an assisted death. So that's that's really part of informed consent for the whole end of life care, and. In an ideal situation, that's part of the serious illness conversation uh, by somebody. Uh, and, you know, it's not at the time of diagnosis. Usually I told you that my friends uh, who got their horrible diagnoses in the last seven years, um, that was one of their first thoughts was, uh, I figured this bad stuff out. Um, <laughs> make sure I have an exit if I don't 
you know, if I get to a point where I can't stand it anymore. Uh, but it's not necessarily that you say to somebody, I'm sorry, uh, this your tests show that the cancer has spread, the chemo is not working anymore. And uh, we need to talk about um, uh, providing the best possible comfort for you um, as you base the end of your life. And uh, that may not be the right day. Maybe it'll be a few weeks later, you know, but it'll yeah, be sometime. Yeah. yeah, that's probably too much information on that day, <laughs> I would say. Do you think there are any cases in which assisted death should not be given as an option? Um. Do you mean diagnoses or? Yeah, diagnoses. Diagnoses? No, I don't think that a diagnosis itself um, uh, takes all your rights away because that's what you're talking about, right? So, uh, as I said, I mean, just because you have a diagnosis of schizophrenia does not mean you have all your rights taken away for the rest of your life. No, you have rights taken away sometimes when you're acutely psychotic. You cannot make dis decisions for yourself. Uh, and legally, your rights will be taken away from you. But once the acute psych psychosis is over, then um, you, like mine, he steps on, um, you have total right over your own body and more. Um, do you have any comments for people who might be skeptical about this procedure? Or uh, who might not understand it or something? Yeah, yeah. Just um, uh, if this is a basic right that people should have, and luckily do in many places, to help control their own dying, and uh, and so it's uh, important that we have the safeguards in our law and in our you know standards and guidelines and so on. To make sure that um, that vulnerable people are not pressured, but uh, we have those, and I'm really confident that um, everywhere I've uh, investigated and know about, uh, like the European countries and Australia and U.S. and Canada, um, it, people take this very seriously and do their assessments carefully and are following the safeguards in our law. Okay, Dr. Ellen Weeb, thank you very much for coming on. Um, if people, you said you had a website, could you tell everybody what the website is if people wanna find out more? Hemlock Aid. Hemlock Aid, okay. Well, thank you very much for coming on. That was very informative. This episode is brought to you by NordVPN. I went back to visit family in Canada and it's still crazy there. I just turned my dad onto NordVPN. Keeping your information away from prying eyes, including the government, particularly if you're in Canada, is a silly thing to not do in this day and age. It's way easier than it was 10 years ago, and you can basically turn NordVPN on to run in the background and forget it's there. NordVPN has award-winning online security, so you can be confident knowing that you won't be exposed to any prying internet eyes, or have your personal information leaked to people who might use it against you. Just go to nordvpn.com slash tmpp, or use promo code tmpp for 61% off their premium plan and their free anti-malware feature, as well as NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. Mark Pickering, welcome to my podcast. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Before we jump in, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Great. So my name is Dr. Mark Pickering. I'm a GP family practitioner by background. Most of the clinical work I do is in prisons and other secure environments. And uh, I lead the Christian Medical Fellowship in the UK. So that's an organization of uh, just under 5,000 doctors, nurses, midwives, and students. So we try to help them live out their faith as Christians in whatever that means. And part of what we do is looking at public policy and bioethics issues. So things at the beginning and end of life are very important in that. So assisted dying um, is really important because there's a lot of pressure to change the law all around the British Isles. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, let's delve into that a little bit. Um, what What is medically assisted dying? It, it really depends who you ask, um, because many people who uh, talk about it, uh, they are not always clear on their definitions. And when you ask the public what they think, they're often not clear either. Um, 
to say that you're assisting someone who's dying, that implies that they're actually dying. So uh, the, the classic situation would be somebody who's terminally ill, maybe they've got cancer or motor neurone disease and they're approaching the end stage of their life and you might say they're in the dying process or the final weeks uh, of life and then they might be suffering with pain or shortness of breath or other symptoms that are difficult to control and they might ask a doctor to give them medication or prescribe medication for them to take so that they can die in a more peaceful fashion than they might do otherwise. Um, but there's so many things wrapped up in that that, uh, that need unpacking that often don't get unpacked. So like I say, to call it assisted dying, um, many people, particularly in Canada, for instance, who access made medical aid in dying, they're not actually dying. They might be chronically ill, they might be disabled. Um, in some places, it might be um, a, a young baby who's very disabled, it might be somebody with a mental disorder. And so you may have a degree of suffering, but they may not be dying. And so that causes a lot of confusion because often if you ask people in the public, what do you understand by assisted dying? They might think that that is the care that you get when you go into a hospice for palliative care. Um, for someone who is dying, you are assisting them by treating their symptoms. That would be a valid um, way to talk, but it's not what most people understand or very often there are complicated ethical decisions towards the end of life. For instance, if you make a do not resuscitate decision um, when someone is um, perhaps approaching the end of their life and you think, okay, there's no point in doing cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, if their heart and lungs stop because it's not going to work. That may be very appropriate just to say, we're going to make that decision that that would not be appropriate. Or you might say, you know, you're having chemotherapy for your cancer, but it's clearly not working. So we think mm -hmm. we should stop that treatment. The treatment is futile. It's not doing you any good. Um, many people think that that is assisted dying because then you're stopping a treatment, which they may see as, as keeping them alive. So there's a whole range of different things. And it's incredibly important to get your definitions right, especially when they change across different uh, countries and jurisdictions and conversations. Currently, what's legal in in the UK? Yeah, so in the UK or, or in the British Isles, you've got a number of different jurisdictions. So there's England and Wales, there's Scotland, there's Jersey, there's the Isle of Man, and then there's the Republic of Ireland. And all of those different jurisdictions have got campaigns to change the law in different ways. So it, it's a, it's illegal to end the life of a patient. So as a doctor, you can't do something that will actively end their life. And if okay. they say to you, please give me a medication so that I can end my life, you can't do that. So it's illegal to encourage or assist a suicide. It's not illegal to commit suicide. It used to be. But, um, you know, many people who try to take their own lives often have mental health challenges. And so if you tried to take your own life because of a mental health problem and you didn't succeed and then you ended up in hospital, you know, what's the point in making you feel worse by then prosecuting you for something, but you still can't encourage or assist a suicide and you can't actually do what we call euthanasia by hmm. a doctor or clinician giving a drug to you to end your life. But you can do all of those other things around the end of life. You can make good decisions about is this particular um, uh, procedure or treatment that you have been having, is that actually benefiting you? Or, or do you want to decide yourself to stop it? Or do we decide as a clinical team that it's not benefiting you and various things around that? So we call that withholding and withdrawing of treatment. And that can be perfectly appropriate. So this is completely different than what's happening in Canada now. Yes, absolutely. So um, my understanding of the law in Canada is that it changed in, I think, 2016, um, where euthanasia first became legal or medical aid in dying, as it's called there, medical assistance in dying, sorry. Um, and when the Canadian law first changed, well, it, you can have either euthanasia or assisted suicide. Euthanasia is basically when the clinician or, or someone else gives the medication to the person, usually through injection to end their life, whereas assisted suicide is where the clinician prescribes it and then uh, provides it to the, the person, but then the person drinks it or takes the tablets themselves. So it's it's a question of who does the final act. And I understand that the vast, vast majority in Canada are euthanasia where the clinician will end the life of the patient. 
usually that's with their express request and permission. But in some situations, particularly in countries like Belgium and Holland, sometimes it happens without the patient making a request. But in Canada, where it started in 2016, um, there was a, a clause that said that the person's death had to be reasonably foreseeable. So in many ways, that's like terminal illness. Um, how we would say many of the proposed laws in the British Isles often put a, a stop on it to say you've got to be within six months of death from a terminal illness. It's very hard to actually guess how long someone has left and how many months they would live otherwise. Um, but that's basically what many laws say. So that originally was there in the Canadian law. But because there was no time put it, then actually that got quite elastic. And so some people whose deaths from their condition may have taken five or ten years were being seen as eligible for MAID. And therefore, um, in 2019, there was a court case in Quebec where two disabled people said, look, this isn't fair. We're not chronically or we're not terminally ill. Our deaths are not reasonably foreseeable, but we are suffering. We want to have access to made as well so they were granted that access and then that led to a change in, in the law across canada so that now your death does not have to be reasonably foreseeable um for many reasons of, of suffering or chronic illness you can request that um and now there's a proposal to extend it further to purely mental conditions i know that's been paused uh, but certainly that's still it, uh, in the plans for canada as well so it really has changed very rapidly over just uh, six or seven years in Canada. Okay, and and what are the downsides if the point of this is to relieve people's suffering? Yeah, so the downsides are largely, um, uh, uh, there's the several of those. So a person's suffering may be temporary. So if someone has cancer, they have pain, they're in a lot of pain, and for instance, maybe their family physician is treating them, their GP, um, and they may not be able to relieve that pain. That person may think, I can't live like this. I want to have um, euthanasia. Um, but if they had access to a, a palliative care specialist who is an expert in dealing with this kind of symptom control, they may be able to get much better pain relief, symptom control, and feel a lot better. Um, there may be other reasons why their distress may be short-lived. It may be that actually the suffering that they're going through is largely psychological and emotional, more about the meaning of what's happening to them. It may be a spiritual cause, what will happen to me after death. There are so many different reasons for that, and somebody may not have had good psychiatric care, they may not have had good palliative care or symptom control. And, and so there's all of these different reasons there. And if we, pass, if we change a law to make it, first of all, legal, then people may access that who didn't necessarily need to have that because like I so said about in Canada the the law has expanded quite rapidly the numbers have grown rapidly the societal expectations have changed quite rapidly so whereas it may have been um, legalized to begin with so that just a small cases would be accessible to euthanasia then that often changes greatly Sometimes we like, we like to think about it, say, if you compare it with speed limits or on, on the road, um, most countries have speed limits, and uh, that's generally sensible. It keeps people safe, and yet we've all been in situations where we think, I wish there wasn't a speed limit here. We might be late for work. We might be late for the airport. We might be late for the cinema. We might Somebody might be ill. We might be having to get them to the hospital. And so it's, you can understand the argument of saying, I wish that if I, you know, I would like to have the choice not to have a speed limit. You know, if I feel that I need to go as fast as I want to, then, you know, I should be able to do that. And you understand that. But then when you start trying to frame a law around that to say, well, like you can only, you know, speed 20 miles an hour above the speed limit. You can only do it if the if the flight that you're trying to get to is really important, you can only do it if it's a medical emergency. You know, all of these things get really complicated. But then what you actually do is you change society so that people just think, actually, speed limits are a bad thing. We should be able to go as fast as we can. And then what becomes my choice then becomes a duty that society has to provide for me. And then actually you change the expectations and the implications for others. You get more road traffic accidents, more deaths of innocent people. And that's quite a good illustration of what can happen because we now see in many countries where the law has been changed 
then investment in palliative care often doesn't keep pace with other countries because people think, well, why yeah. should we spend all this time trying to control your symptoms? Let's just give you euthanasia. Why don't you opt for that? If you're an elderly person with chronic Ill illnesses and infirmities, you may be using up the money that you'd like to give to your children and grandchildren to buy a house with, and you might be using it up in social care costs. Mm, and so yeah. then the expectation comes on you. Aren't you being a bit selfish by staying alive and eating up that money? You know, yes, you may be suffering a bit, but actually it's hard for your family to care for you. Surely you should be asking for that. And even if people are not saying that to you, then there's, there's, definitely an expectation that comes onto people because when we when people talk about safeguards with changing the law they'll often say oh you know our law has got lots of safeguards around it so that nobody will request it who doesn't really want it that sounds fine when you're looking to change the law but what's my what seems like a safeguard on one side of the law change when you look at it from the other side after you've changed the law then people start talking about barriers to patient access so most countries will say We'll only do it for people who are terminally ill. And that sounds great. But then like in Canada, you do that, you change people's expectations. And then some people, a few people who may be disabled or chronically ill will say, well, why don't we have yeah. access to that? You know, we're suffering for a long time too. Don't you care about us? And then suddenly you have to widen it because you say, well, well this isn't fair. We have to provide this for everyone. As soon as you say that medically assisted death medically provided death is something that's good that you should be able to provide, then on what grounds can you limit it and not give it to other people? So is your opinion that it's just a slippery slope and we shouldn't go in that direction at all? Or should it be available for people to stay with motor neuron disease that are definitely suffering and definitely going to die relatively soon? Yeah, I think that those are exactly the kind of questions to ask. So the, the term slippery slope, some people love it, some people hate it. Um, you know, it can give you the idea that like if you're on skis, if you push off the top of the slope, you'll go straight the way down to the bottom. It's cut, it's really hard to stop. That's not always a great um, analogy, but what we often prefer to talk about is incremental extension, that once you've crossed that first barrier, you say, okay, terminal illness, great. Then what about people with chronic illness and disability? Then you say only people over 18. Well, what if you're 16 and mature? Or, uh, you know, then you say only with mental capacity. Well, what if you've got early onset dementia? You, We know that you don't want to, you know, advance dementia. So even though you don't quite qualify, maybe we should extend it that way. So um, it's very hard to, to keep a law at one place and never to change it. Virtually every jurisdiction that's changed the law has extended it further in different ways. Yeah, that makes sense. I think one of the things I'm concerned at least about in Canada is, um, and I used to be in chronic pain from arthritis and I, I had a number of surgeries for that and getting access to pain medication. There was a three month waiting period when yep. I was 17, three months when you're in chronic pain, severe chronic pain is a very, very long time. And so if the access to ending things, if it doesn't seem like you have some sort of future is easier than the access to pain medication. And the healthcare system in Canada too, is like, even though they think it's world-class, it is not a world-class healthcare system. So that's concerning. Um, but I can also see where people are coming from having watched people die of dementia slowly and painfully. I, I can see, do you know, do you know what's happened in Switzerland? Because Switzerland's had more access to medically assisted death for a while right and even people from out of switzerland can go and travel there for it do you know what the stats look like there like is it more old people yeah uh, so switzerland is is an, an unusual place yeah, they have had um provision for assisted dying i think since the 1930s and so some mm -hmm. people in the uk who want to access that but they can't do it in the uk they will sometimes travel to switzerland and um, usually that's assisted suicide where the patient drinks the medication or takes the tablets. Sometimes it can be euthanasia. They're quite broad in their um, in the categories that they will allow. Um, many of the providers in Switzerland will only provide it to Swiss citizens, but there are a couple of organizations who will allow people from other countries to go there. 
And some people look at that and say, you know, it's just been part of Swiss culture for years. You know, we shouldn't worry about it. You know, they, they haven't started killing everybody. It hasn't really extended massively. And I think there is a certain argument for that. But then you look at another country like Canada and you think, why has it gone so far, so fast, so quickly? Um, and, and really changing the culture very fast. And people will sometimes point to Oregon in the USA and say, well, they've had it since 1997. The law hasn't changed much. You know, that's the kind of law we want. But you can't promise that when you ask for Oregon that you won't get Canada. And you can't say, well, I like Switzerland. You might get Belgium because um, attitudes to so many things are different in different cultures and things will have different effects. You know, Switzerland is a very wealthy country. Um, people have a very high standard of living. Um, and there's, I haven't looked at the stats in, in great detail there, but I think you'll, you'll have a lot less social deprivation. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll have a lot less people who can't get access to the health care that they need. Whereas, very sadly, we're hearing in Canada some horrific stories of people who, you know, they just want good housing. They just want good medical care or social care. And actually, they've got a constitutional right to be killed by the state. They can access made very quickly, but they can't access good housing. Like you said about the, um, about the pain medication, you may not be able to get the health care that will actually reduce your suffering. And so that's a terrible situation to be in. Uh, you know, we may say that doesn't happen very often, but it is happening in some situations. And if people say, if, if we're saying, well, you've got a right to access euthanasia, but you don't have a right to access prompt social and medical care, that's setting up a whole problem for us that I, I think we should be incredibly worried about. And especially when you've got cost of living crisis, you've got um, a mental health crisis, uh, particularly after COVID, there's so many factors that should lead us to be very careful indeed. Can you go into more detail about what's going on in Belgium? You said you can be euthanized against your will in some cases? Yeah, so uh, in Bel Belgium and Holland have both had um, uh, euthanasia for some years. Uh, Holland came first and then Belgium, I think, was about 20 years ago. And they have seen that steady expansion of the criteria so that to begin with in Belgium, again, it was just for terminally ill people. And now it's expanded gradually. People have become more comfortable with it. And then people are... Uh, less willing to actually go through the criteria um, properly so that doctors become less careful about checking whether someone actually fulfills the criteria. If you go to one doctor and they say you don't fulfill them, then you can go to another doctor who says you do. And we have what you call doctor shopping when people will go around and find a doctor that they know is positive mm -hmm. about euthanasia, ask them, and then of course they'll help, help with them. Um, so, uh, most in most situations euthanasia would be what you call voluntary when someone say you know goes through different um uh, different uh, procedures um questions and and uh, screening uh, things where you you'd make sure that they really want to have the euthanasia that they've actually looked at their options maybe experienced palliative care or psychiatric care um they've maybe seen two doctors you know, so you can do that quite well but in many situations you don't um and that would be voluntary euthanasia if you know for certain that the patient has requested it. You can have, on the other set, on the other hand, non-voluntary euthanasia when you just don't ask them. Uh, if, for instance, you had a patient who had advanced dementia, they may have said something in the past. You know, if I ever get like this, I don't want to live. You know, I would want to have euthanasia if I ever got severe dementia. The trouble is when people actually get to that point, you don't know if their opinion then is the same as it would have been when they were healthy. Many people look differently on life when they actually are disabled or um, suffering in some ways because the life that they didn't expect to have is still better than no life at all. But if someone's in advanced dementia and you think out of compassion they would want us to end their life, you can't get consent from them, but you might decide that that's the way to do it. Or you may just think, actually, it's too much difficulty to fill out the forms. And we're seeing some really, really bad cases in Belgium, I think, when people are just not going through the procedures because it's become more normal. And so some elderly people, I understand, will go into hospital in Belgium, actually trying to be really clear, do not give me euthanasia, because they're worried that 
actually somebody might make that decision for them. Mm. And then you've got involuntary euthanasia when the patient may not even want it, but you decided it's the right thing for them. Now, thankfully, there are very few cases like that, but there was a, a case recently, I forget whether it was Holland or Belgium, but a patient had said previously that they would like euthanasia if they got, if their dementia got to a certain stage. It did progress. Then they said to them, would you like to have it? And they said, no. Oh, that's a bit odd. You know, some days they'd say yes, some days they'd say no. Of course, it's dementia. It's hard to judge their mental capacity. It may fluctuate. And so then the the family and the clinical team decided, okay, we go, we're going to go ahead with it because that's what they said before. We'll give them some medication to make them drowsy. Then we'll give them further medication to end their life. The patient was actually, you know, refusing, fighting it off. And it, it and actually oh. then someone held them down while the doctor euthanized them because they believed that that's what the patient would have wanted. And there was a, a criminal investigation there. Nobody was charged um, and... You know, it, it's very rare in these situations, even when people don't follow the rules, it's very rare that anyone gets into trouble. Have you heard in Canada about um, organ donation and and uh, euthanasia? What's going on with that? Yeah, so uh, my understanding is that uh, quite a number of organs for transplant are now coming from patients uh, with euthanasia. Um, clearly, if you have a medically controlled euthanasia you can have everything set up to go the it may take place within a hospital you could have anesthetists and transplant surgeons on hand so that the quality of the organs that you get is coming is actually very good you can have it very quickly between euthanasia and then organ harvesting now um I, and i understand that organs coming from the euthanasia cases that the majority of those in the world are coming from canada now you can look at that and you say well you know, isn't that a good thing? Because, you know, this patient wants to die, but they want to contribute to help someone else live. Isn't that altruistic? And yes, it might be. But then, goodness, what what sort of um, conflict is that putting someone in to say, well, actually, you know, maybe I don't want to live, or maybe, my, maybe I'm a burden on my family. Maybe I should ask for euthanasia. Oh, and, and actually, I could then give my organs to someone else who may benefit from them. So there's an emotional pressure um, that really shouldn't be there. Um, you know, we, we would quite reasonably be um, very upset to think that executed prisoners in China might be um, having their organs removed without their consent. But actually, if it's coming from euthanasia patients who might be influenced by that decision, then that could be a problem indeed. Uh, it doesn't have to be a massive problem, but you can see there's a, a real danger of that complicating the decision that the patient makes. That, that could easily complicate it if you're suffering from a mental disorder that's making you feel like a burden, like you said. So you already feel like a burden. You've had this mental disorder for 20 years. You're not getting the proper care. And hey, you can go out, stop your suffering and save some people. Yeah, absolutely. And a mental mental illness is a massive problem within the within this situation so i mentioned before that the when the canadian law changed uh, a year or two ago to um to remove that reasonably foreseeable death criterion then they put a clause in to say that in i think 2023 so coming up this year then it would then open out to people who purely had mental health conditions as well now there's been a lot of um a, a lot of resistance to that more recently I understand and I think that's been paused but I don't think there's been any um, intention to to remove it and I, I listened to a Canadian documentary recently by I think it's a senator who was a psychiatrist who was the one who pushed for that clause to be um, inserted and it was really quite frightening to hear him saying you know it's terribly it's terribly stigmatizing to people with mental mental illness you know they should have access to what everyone else does you know if it's good enough for other people mentally ill people should be able to get it as well and there's a terrifying cold logic to that as well but then you think goodness if your only problem is a severe depression or schizophrenia or a, a personality disorder if you are suffering mentally then you know, how will that affect your decision-making power? You know, how do we know that 
um, some more time on treatment or some different treatment might actually make things a lot better. And, and I look after a lot of people with schizophrenia, personality disorders in my clinical work, and many of them have chronic suicidal thinking. So an emotionally unstable personality disorder that often goes along with self-harm, that could be present for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And that person will every day feel like killing themselves. They may sometimes self-harm, they may sometimes attempt suicide, but that doesn't go away. There's no pill that you can give to necessarily remove that with, with psychotherapy. You may be able to help it significantly, help them to control it. But once you say that a person in that situation should be eligible to say, hey, that's enough, I, you know, I want to have euthanasia as well, okay, but you know, how much are you um, opening that up to other people whose suffering may be short-lived, they may simply not have had good um, psychiatric care, there may be so much else they can do, and then when people feel the burden, um, which is a massive reason why people opt for euthanasia, then you're not saying, no, no, don't feel like that. You know, you're not a burden. We will look after you, whatever it takes. Suddenly you change it. You say, maybe you're right. Maybe you are a burden. Maybe this would be a good thing. That's how you feel. We agree with you. What does it do for suicide prevention in mentally ill people or, or mentally suffering people to, to change from saying, whatever happens, we will always support you to, in certain circumstances, we will actually help to kill you. That's crazy. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it's crazy. Um, what are you working on specifically to kind of push back against this? Well, I think one of the things in the British Isles um, is, is really helping to show people the logical consequences of what they are proposing. So here in the British Isles or in the UK, that the main campaigning organization is called Dignity in Dying. And they're very focused on their campaign goals. They say, we only want um, assisted suicide, not euthanasia. And we only want it for adults who are mentally competent. So they, they can make that decision genuinely that they're terminally ill and that they have less than six months to live. And that's a very tight campaign. They've changed those campaign goals over the years because they've realized they've had many decades of being unsuccessful in changing the law. And so now they're saying, okay, we're going to focus it down on this. There's much more chance of getting a law passed through parliament. And there is, because when you put it that way, you say, look, this is just a small change, just for a small number of people at the end of their life. You know, why would you force them to suffer? But the trouble is there are, there are other organizations who don't think they go far enough. Here in the UK, there's another group called My Death, My Decision that looks to Canadian euthanasia and says, that's great. That's what we want to have in the UK. So then, so dignity in dying, I think are being very naive or possibly, um, possibly something worse than that. When they say, don't worry, you know, we'll, if we get our law, then it won't extend further because you know, there are people already campaigning to, to push it further. Um, you know, we look and see in Canada how, how fast things have gone and why, you know, why would we think that things wouldn't go like that? You know, we're a similar country in many ways in terms of our culture. And I think it's foolish to just believe that that, that wouldn't happen here, even if it didn't go half as far or half as fast, that would really worry me. Um, and also when we're looking at, um, how the law can change in a country, um, it, it's really important to see, well, in the different jurisdictions around you, what are the what are the rules that they're trying to to put across? So in Jersey, for instance, they do what's called a citizen's jury, which is when you ask people from the population what they think should happen. And the the, the general public are generally more liberal or more lax in the rules that they would have than politicians are, because politicians at least have the professional responsibility to think what about the unintended consequences. Whereas most individual people just think, well, I'd want that for me or for my loved one. And it, it's not their job to think, well, what could go wrong with this? Whereas for a politician, you hope it is. So Dignity and Dying were campaigning heavily in Jersey to change the law. And it's quite possible they may change the law. Now we're looking for, we're waiting for some draft, uh, a draft bill to their parliament to look at. But the citizens jury said, we don't want just want assisted suicide. We want euthanasia as well. We don't just want it for terminal illness, we want it for chronic illness and disability. 
and some of the people in there in there said we want it for those under 18 those uh, with dementia that sort of thing not all of those got through but it's a, a significantly wider law than dignity and dying actually we're asking for. So we often say, be careful what you wish for. Okay, Mark, I think that answers all my questions. Um, I didn't know that about Belgium. So that's freaky. <laughs> it, it is. Um, yeah, do talk, yeah. Do you want to talk just a little bit about how faith impacts on that? Sure, sure. Go ahead. So, I mean, it, it's one of the common responses that people who are campaigning to change a law will say to someone like me, they say, oh, it's just because you're religious, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. you believe in the sanctity of life. I don't believe in that. So, you know, your reasons don't matter. Um, but then on the other hand, you have lots of religious people who say, well, you know, Jesus taught us compassion, you know, therefore we should relieve suffering. So the former Archbishop of Canterbury in the UK, George Carey, who's now in the House of Lords, He's a supporter of assisted dying, but really interestingly, mm. he campaigns for dignity in dying, who have that very tightly focused campaign, but the actual situations, the cases that changed his mind were people who had chronic disability and chronic illness. They were not terminally ill. So he even admits that the people that changed his mind, the situations are not the ones that he's campaigning for. So, you know, of course he's going to, if he gets his, his, um, law that he wants a tightly conscripted law he's still going to want to have compassion on those other people who are going further so you see that law change has got the seeds of its own expansion within it but it's not about whether you have a, a faith it's about how you apply that and for many people you know the way i look at it is it's about making sure that vulnerable people are not put at risk by law that um that the autonomy of one group of people doesn't impact on the safety of others. And these are just generic things. You don't have to have a faith to understand that. There are plenty of humanists and atheists who are opposed to it as well. So I think we must be really careful before writing off somebody just because they have you know, one faith or another view or the wrong kind of view. Very often the, the reasons behind um, opposition to law change, they are, are the same across all faiths and none. Okay, I'm actually glad you brought that up because yesterday I was like, okay, Mark Pickering, um, and then you're you're part of it, and I'm a Christian, but I didn't want the Christian perspective on this because I was like, so so many people will write that off, right? It's like, but so I'm very glad you covered that, um, and I think everything you spoke about makes sense. So thank you again. Is there anywhere I can lead people to online where they can learn more about this? Yeah, absolutely. So within the UK, we've got carenotkilling.org.uk. So that's an, an organization that I speak on behalf of. Uh, for clinicians and healthcare workers, there's a, a, a linked group called ourdutyofcare.org.uk. And then for those working in Parliament, uh, dyingwell.co.uk, uh, uh, which is um, a group of parliamentarians in in uh, Westminster, particularly who are opposed to changing the law. So, all of those have got great um, uh, great information on the links to other places. So, I'd really um, encourage people to go and have a look at those. Okay, thank you very much for joining us, Michaela. You're very welcome. Thank you.